Hello everyone, this is Craig Fitch with Oculus. Welcome to another Oculus webinar. We certainly thank you for attending this webinar, Utility of Keratograph 5M and Building a Dry Eye Center of Excellence. Our speaker is Dr. Marguerite McDonald. Dr. Marguerite McDonald received her medical degree from Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. Currently she is a clinical professor for ophthalmology at New York University in Manhattan an adjunct clinical professor for ophthalmology at Tulane University Medical School in New Orleans. She is a staff physician at Manhattan Eye and Ear Throat Hospital, TLC in Garden City, New York, Island Eye Surgery Center in Carl Place, New York, and Mercy Medical Center in Rockville Center, New York. For her pioneering work in refractive surgery, she has received numerous recognitions, awards, and has over a thousand publications in the field of cornea and refractive surgery. She serves on numerous editorial boards of clinical and scientific journals and is an active member of the multiple national and international professional societies. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions throughout this webinar, please use the question box at the right of your screen to, uh, to enter in your questions and at the end of the webinar we will have the opportunity to answer some of these questions for you. So without further delay, please welcome Dr. Marguerite McDonald. Thank you, Craig. And Hello to everyone. Thank you for giving me part of your evening. So we're going to move right along. And now these are my disclosures. So why would a cataract or refractive surgeon be interested in dry eye? We're going to go through the why and, um, and go over a little of the prevalence data. And then step-by-step step exactly how to build a dry eye center of excellence, and then we'll get into the finances and talking actual dollars. So first of all, dry eye is much more prevalent than was previously recognized. Uh, if you, uh, okay, advance, mm, okay, yeah, now we're advancing. Okay, the, whoop, the estimates on the prevalence vary widely and this is because the disease has been defined differently over the years. You'll see that the Women's Health Study thought the prevalence was only 7.8%, but in an Allergan phone survey, it was 48%. And, and once again, that's because the definition has been uh, poorly stated over the years. Every single uh, clinical trial used a different definition. Tear film osmolarity is actually the single most important metric in detecting the presence of dry eye syndrome. And uh, it is the common final pathway, whether it's evaporative or aqueous deficient. And as a matter of fact, the dry eye workshop uh, dues report in 2007 said that dry eye was a multifactorial disease of the tears on the ocular surface that involved increased osmolarity of the tear film, and that's in the first sentence. So, you know, of course there's inflammation of the ocular surface uh, and dysfunction of one or more of those tear film components that results in tear film instability and damage to the ocular surface, discomfort, and uh, visual disturbance. So that is super important, and uh, like I said, the common final pathway for how damage occurs. And you know what? We're having such a huge delay between when I click. I apologize. Let's see if we can get the timing down better. Um, and as you see here, osmolarity is in the diagnosis of dry eye disease, uh, not only from the DUES workshop, but also uh, from the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Uh, it is the gold standard test for dry eye has a positive predictive value, as you see here, PPV, that's far greater than Schirmer's tear breakup time staining or meniscus height, which are the older dry eye tests. Uh, the Keratograph 5M and uh, several other tests are now um, the, the newer standard. So I mentioned that tear osmolarity is actually listed uh, by the American Academy of Ophthalmology uh, in the definition of dry eye in their preferred practice pattern publication. They're white papers that they come out with periodically. So here you see tear osmolarity has been shown to be a more sensitive method of diagnosing and grading severity of dry eye comp compared to all the older tests. So let's see, we'll move on. Here we go. So how does it damage the surface? Well, whoop, there we go. 
uh, it causes inflammation and apoptosis, which is uh, programmed cell suicide. When the corneal epithelial cells and the conjunctival epithelial cells become unhappy enough, they actually start a process that kills themselves. So apoptosis, and um, it, it certainly it leads to a breakdown of the homeostatic control of the ocular surface, causing tear film instability, and reduces the ability even of the mucins to lubricate the eye. So um, the dry eye patients uh, represent a huge segment of our patient population. Here you see in this study from Cheer Science that about 30 to 40 percent of the patients in ophthalmic practices have clinically significant dry eye. That's toe-to-toe -to -toe with cataracts, 23 million for dry eye and 24 million for cataract patients. And uh, okay, there we go. This is another study. This is from oh, Hopkins. And it shows that with real numbers from the year 2004 and estimated numbers for the year 2020, that there will be between 2004 and the year 2020 a 38% increase in dry eye. Of course, there will also be a 47% increase in cataracts, and you see the other age-related diseases, a huge spike in those as well. So this is a fascinating dry eye prevalence study that was completed recently and has been pr uh, presented uh, to um, the JCRS for publication. This was conducted at 150 sites across the United States. Over 9,000 subjects were in the study, everybody coming in the door. The age range was from 7 to 107 years of age. So these people were assessed uh, for demographics, medical history, and they had to say yes or no regarding nine classic symptoms of dry eye, fluctuating vision, watery eyes, tired eyes, sandy, gritty, et cetera. So we, we found a, a, a few interesting things. Um, first of all, uh, they defined dry eyes as people with hyperosmolarity, greater than 308 milliosmoles per liter. And um, it turns out that the average osmolarity for this the healthy group was 297 milliosmoles per liter. For the unhealthy or dry eye group was 323 milliosmoles per liter. And notice that the range was plus or minus 7 for the normals and plus or minus 17 for the hyperosmolar or dry eye patients. So in other words, the inter-eye difference is much greater uh, because the instability is greater. Now, this also shows tear film instability in dry eyes. Across the top row are dry eye patients that were measured three times during the course of a day on three consecutive days. And you can see the right and left eye are swinging all over the place. Uh, the normal, the definition of uh, dry eye here, you see the hash line is at 308. They're swinging all over the place. So any little thing can disturb them. Uh, wind, um, uh, a glass of wine, taking a claret, and they just swing all over the place, whereas you see the three normal subjects on the bottom row are rock solid stable pretty much. And no matter what happens to them, to them during the day, they take a Lipitor or they sit outside at a tennis game, they're going to ha they have such great reserves that they can keep us stable. Dad, you're dead? Well. That means I'm fine. I'll go to the lake and buy some fish. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we have some interference. Um, that's, not, that's not coming from my microphone, so I apologize. Um, we're going to the next slide. All right, let me try again. See if we can advance. There we go. Okay, now um, this is sort of interesting. Observe differences between hyperosmolar and normal participants. So um, this is really fascinating. Half of the population, basically, at these 9,000 people just strolling in for any different reason, you know, cataracts, LASIK eval, annual eye exam, half of the general population has dry eye. But when you look at the, the far right column, the hyperosmolar patients, only half of them have had three or more positive complaints. So that means the other half that have clinically significant dry eye had no complaints. Now, if we look at the uh, normal column, less than or equal to 308 milliosmol, uh, milliosmoles per liter, half of the normals had complaints that sounded like dry eye, but weren't dry eye. 
The other half were, of course, asymptomatic, but half, 49%. So just remember half. Half of the normals have complaints that sound like dry eye. Half of the dry eye patients have no complaints at all. And half of the American population has dry eye, clinically significant dry eye. So this is a huge, huge opportunity for us. And once again, there's a little lag here. So what if you have somebody with normal osmolarity, but they've got ocular surface complaints? Well, it's something in the left column here. The mo I think the most commonly overlooked conditions are epithelial basement membrane dystrophy, conjunctivopalasis, lagophthalmus, and demodex blepharitis. But basically, it means go back and look for something else. I think this is also why um, cyclosport emulsion, or stasis, uh, fails in some people, because people were, patients were given restasis when they had something else going on. They sounded like they had dry eyes, but they didn't. And of course, uh, restasis won't do anything for demodex blepharitis or lagophthalmus or conjunctivocalasis. So it's important to sort this out. Now, um, the majority of dry eye patients have evaporative dry eye disease. This is exactly the opposite of what we thought a few years ago. Turns out that 86% of patients have uh, some, with dry eyes also have signs of meibomian gland dysfunction. Pure aqueous deficient dry eye is actually uh, relatively rare. Only 10% of the dry eye population has pure aqueous. There's a recent publication out of um, University of Houston indicating that it's not 86%, it's 92%. So the vast majority of dry eye patients have evaporative dry eye disease. And I'm apologizing for this lag here. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. So just to summarize quickly, because this is important, if you're going to have a dry eye center uh, of excellence, you really need to get into your osmolarity. Healthy eyes are normal and stable. They're somewhere between 290 and 295 milliosmoles per liter, and they vary very little. And so when they're in proper homeostasis with the blood, in dry eye, your osmolarity is elevated. And in dry eye, the tear film becomes very unstable, leading to tremendous inter-eye variability and moment-to-moment -moment variations. So it's not a crummy test, it's a crummy disease. Uh, the symptoms do not correlate with osmolarity at all. So clinically significant dry eyes can be advanced and asymptomatic. But dry eye, as defined by elevated tear osmolarity, is far more prevalent than has been previously assumed. So. This is a good place to start and, and then uh, to incorporate that and get comfortable with that uh, in your practice. Now, Craig, I don't know if we can do anything uh, about the lag here. I think we're just going to have to live with it. Um, now, if left untreated, dry eye profoundly impacts surgical outcomes. And um, let me go back. Whoop. Okay. Uh-uh. Okay. okay. So this is a study uh, that was presented by Eric Donnefeld, my colleague uh, on Long Island, at ESCRS in 2011 and has been submitted for publication. This indicates how does dry eye impact refractive surgery. So 128 subjects uh, who were pre-LASIK had an analysis and um, if they were determined uh, to be hyperosmal or clinically dry, if their pre-op osmolarity was greater than or equal to 308 milliosmoles per liter. So they were split into two groups, treated pre-op or untreated. And the treatment was with a hyaluronic acid containing tear, basically blink. So the patients all had LASIK with the Vizek Star S4 with uh, IR, and they had their HA tear blink, and the surgeon's post-op protocol uh, and therapy was uncontrolled after one month. So the only difference was, did they get blink pre-op or not? And they, they everything uh, was basically the same post-op. So this shows look, there is elevated tear osmolarity basically as the cause of poor, uncorrected, and best corrected vision post-op. So the blue columns on the left show how poorly the untreated uh, hyperosmolar patients did whereas normal osmolars and patients that were pretreated with blink had a much better uncorrected and best corrected acuity. So the enhancement rate goes down if you pretreat uh, patients with uh, dry eyes, 
the, the pre-op measurements are more accurate, as you'll see. This, uh, this shows, uh, this is also from my colleague Eric, that if you detect the dry eye and treat it before surgery, you will have much better outcomes. You are, uh, the way you program the laser for LASIK and even your IOL power calculations will be vastly improved. This happens to be a patient who, that was pre-LASIK. Dry eye on the left before treatment with cyclosporin. After only uh, two weeks of cyclosporin on the right, you see already a huge improvement in the topography. Now, the FACO study, I must mention this. This is also submitted for publication. This was a multi-center clinical trial that was the brainchild of Bill Trattler from Florida, and we participated in the study on Long Island. And this was just to determine the prevalence of dry eye in patients undergoing cataract surgery. And it turns out that a patient scheduled for cataract surgery, all comers at all of those various practices around the United States, are cataract surgery patients symptomatic for dry eye? Well, it turns out for foreign body sensation complaints, 59% said never, and 28% said uh, some of the time. So in other words, as far as foreign body sensation, half of the time, most or all the time, only 13% of the patients complained. And yet, there were 76.8% of the patients that had corneal staining, and 50% had central corneal staining, which is, uh, signifies extreme dry eye. So once again, symptoms don't correlate. We have to use other methods to detect the dry eye. 21.3% of these cataract patients, 272 eyes, had a Schirmer score less than or equal to 5, which is low and terrible. But uh, 132 eyes, 48.5%, had a score less than or equal to 10, which still signifies uh, mild to moderate dry eye. So patients are often asymptomatic. Dry eye signs are very common in patients scheduled for cataract surgery. More than 60% had an abnormal tear, uh, well, tear breakup time. More than 60% had a very abnormal tear breakup time, less than or equal to five seconds. Corneal staining, 50% had severe central corneal staining and 21.3% had a very low Schirmers. So we have, to, we have to look for this because it does have an impact on outcomes. As I said, it impacts IOL calculations. You can get incorrect keratometry, the wrong IOL power. It impacts our surgical planning for LRIs or toric IOLs as far as the axis and or the magnitude. So um, it's really important to identify dry eye and treat it pre-op. Next is an example from Bill Traveler. He had a 60-year-old male who came in and wanted a presbyopic IOL. If he had planned the surgery on that day in this very dry eye, as you can see from the topography map, very irregular, he would have selected uh, a 20-diopter IOL. But Bill diagnosed the dry eye and chose to treat him. And after only one week of cyclosporin twice a day and some topical steroids, uh, you can see there's an improvement in the topography, and the proper IOL is now a 21. He would have been a diopter off had he gone with his initial plan when he first met this 60-year-old gentleman with dry eyes. So building the case here now, it's easier to treat today because of the new diagnostic and therapeutic technologies. Our accuracy uh, in both diagnosing and coming up with a clinical plan have both been included. So we're going to talk briefly about thermal pulsation therapy. It's a very useful addition uh, to the therapeutic armamentarium. So this is from Tier Science. This is the lipoflow system. It starts on the far left. It's actually got three components, the lipoview ocular surface interferometer. There's a meibomian gland evaluator, that little device in the center, which applies a, a precise amount of pressure to the meibomian glands. Uh, more precise, of course, than uh, pressing with your finger. And on the far right, the treatment aspect is the lipoflow thermal pulsation system. And um, basically, the ocular surface interferometer measures lipid layer thickness and um, with using white light interferometry, it can, gives you a report. And um, then the thermal pulsation system uh, is a 12-minute 
procedure. It feels like a spa treatment. It evacuates the obstructed meibomian glands in all four lids, and it is a great addition to any dry eye center of excellence. And uh, we have two units, uh, and we uh, operate them uh, all day, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays with our optometry team. That is uh, just very, very helpful because the lids are warmed, and uh, after about two minutes into this 12-minute treatment, the pulsations start, and you know the the warmth, and of course the lids get much warmer than they could ever get with hot compresses at home. So all the altered mybum becomes liquid again, like it should be, and then the air bladders cause gentle waves of pulsation from the back of the glands to the orifice, and all the nasty goo, as I call it, when I'm talking to the patients, all the nasty goo gets extruded and uh, comes out in the cups. So they start with, uh, you know, clear, healthy, empty glands, and it buys them about a year of uh, increased comfort, better vision, and they're doing far, far less of their regimen. They can dump 50 to 75 percent of the typical regimen that they're on with the soaks and scrubs and the ointment at night and the doxycycline and the cyclosporin and the preservative-free cheers. So it, it, they, they save on co-pays for medicine, co-pays for doctor visits, and they have a whole lot more time in their day. So that's something that's, I think, a very important part of a dry eye center of excellence. Here you see um, in the FDA clinical trial that led to approval, um, the, the group was put on daily warm compresses at baseline. By two weeks, uh, in two weeks of doing warm compresses twice a day, their total meibomian gland score really hadn't changed much at all. They got crossed over to a lipoflow treatment, and within two more weeks, their total meibomian gland score, the higher the better, was almost double. So it does work, and it's been extremely popular on Long Island. There's a test that was just FDA approved a few weeks ago. Uh, the MMP9 test, matrix metalloproteinase test. It looks for proteolytic enzymes that are produced by stressed epithelial cells on the ocular surface. It is, however, a nonspecific inflammatory marker. So if you get a positive test, it means the eyes are inflamed. You have to figure out why they're inflamed. So, for instance, if you had a normal uh, tear osmolarity but an elevated MMP9 score, the normal range being 3 to 41 nanograms per mil, it's not the patient's complaining, but it's not dry eyes, it's something else, and you have to figure out what it is. Um, often it is um, ocular surface allergy, etc. but it does go up. So if both are elevated, then you know you've got a real dry eye, and it is a rapid uh, one-use-only test, uh, point-of-care test, and it takes about 10 minutes to do the test. The technician goes in and uses uh, this little uh, test cassette touches it, so you see step one, uh, along the inferior conge, snaps the test co collector uh, and the cassette together, you immerse it just for 20 seconds in a buffer, and then you leave it on uh, the exam table top for 10 minutes. So, you know, the, uh, the two lines are positive, one line is negative, but it means that enough fluid uh, was sucked up into the cassette to give you uh, a negative reading. And if you get no bars at all, that means you didn't get enough fluid and it's an invalid test. So this is based on the same technology that the Adno Plus uh, Adno detector is based upon. And so the technician goes in, does this, leaves a post-it note on the door so the doctor knows not to go back in until 10.41 a.m. because that's when the test will be, will be positive. But once again, it is non-specific. It just tells you that the eye is inflamed. But I think, um, I think it, it will also be uh, definitely part of any dry eye center of excellence. But now, whoop, the Keratograph 5M, which has been a huge, a huge help for our, our practice. Uh, this is a unit that does many, many things. First, it's a great corneal topographer, placido-based. It helps tremendously with contact lens fitting. Uh, as well as pre-op diagnosis of keratoconus and other ectatic disorders that might be a rule out for LASIK. You know, it helps you uh, choose what sort of intraocular lens to place in your patient. If they do have keratoconus, for instance, you might might want to steer away from a multifocal IOL. 
maybe toward a monofocal or perhaps a uh, crystal lens. So it's a great placebo-based corneal topographer, but it has several other very accurate methods for measuring dry eye. And as you'll see toward the end of the talk, it can be not only are you helping your patient, you can help the bottom line of your practice a great deal. So um, once again, a great corneal topographer with the color-coded contour map that we're used to seeing. And you see, even with the raw data, uh, you can see pathology, as with any good placebo system. And there are plenty enough rings to get high-quality data. This just shows a case of inferior keratoconus, which is easily recognizable with a lopsided bow tie, the inferior lobe being larger than the superior lobe. And um, the reason that it can be used for several different dry eye uh, tests is that there is a new illumination system. So there is the white placido ring, and there's, which is, you see the far left. There's the infrared LED spots used for the MIBO scan. There are blue LED spots that can help you with contact lens fitting. And white LED spots, which is the tear foam scan. And we'll go over those one by one. There's also a new magnification changer, because depending on, on the task at hand, you'll need a different field of view. Sometimes you need an 11 millimeter field of view, like for topography. Uh, the tear film scan uses uh, 9 and 11. And the largest field of view is for the retina scan and the MIBO scan. And we'll explain what all those things are. So between the different illuminations and the different magnification settings, uh, you can do a tremendous amount of dry eye evaluation with a high degree of accuracy. So let me explain how this all works. So. There we go. The tear meniscus height measurement. Um, when you have dry eyes, you don't have a nice, even tear meniscus. Uh, often you have debris and mucus, mucus as a response to injury. So at this uh, lighting, and with the new magnification changer, you get an image of the curvature right along the lower lid margin. And the area under that curve can be analyzed automatically. So these are, uh, that's highly valuable. This is one of the most valuable, I think, the non-invasive keratograph breakup time. Tear breakup time is notoriously difficult to measure. And whenever they do a dry eye clinical trial, they'll send a team around to each of the investigation sites, trying to teach everybody to do it the same way. It's extremely difficult, which is why it's one in the past, it's been one of the noisiest measurements. However, this is highly repeatable. It's objective. It's, the dry eye is not only uh, measured for where it breaks up, but it automatically classifies the dry eye for the doctor as stage 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Very non-invasive, very fast. You can show uh, response to treatment. You can document, uh, for, and you can communicate with the patients. It's very, very easy for patients to understand these maps. And let me show you an example of what that means. So this is a healthy young person. And the color-coded map on the right refers to seconds. So this young lady had her eye held open for almost 30 seconds, and there was absolutely no tear breakup. So this stops at 24, almost 25 seconds. But she had such, such a healthy tear lake that it's all green. There was no breakup, so she is level zero. So she has no dry eye. Now, this next person isn't so lucky. This person has no green at all. This is someone whose tear film is breaking up so quickly, you can see there are areas that broke up in 1.5 seconds. And believe it or not, this is only a level two dry eye. There are people that are far worse than, than this uh, older lady. So this shows you where it breaks up first, second, third, so you can see that um, this is a level two dry eye, and you can show this to the patient, and, they're sh and then especially if you show them a picture like the one before, what a normal eye looks like and what their eye looks like, 
this hits home, this really encourages compliance, and as you'll see, you can bill for these. So here's a person with moderate dry eye right before using the uh, Lipiflow uh, liposome spray. So 10 minutes after using the spray, you can see what a huge improvement there is. So since most people have a component of evaporative dry eye, um, many experts, including the recent meibomian gland workshop, recommend that at stage two and higher, you use a liposome spray. And they really do work and they last for hours. So this, you can show the patient immediately, look, look how much better you are. And so that will encourage compliance with your regimen. Okay, now, lipid layer assessment. Whenever you have a thick lipid layer, you see lots and lots of colors in it, which is why if you're walking through a garage uh, and there's an oil slick in the garage, you look down and you'll see all these beautiful colors. That means it's a thick puddle. So the more colors you see, the thicker the layer of oil. And so this shows the cheer film. And this shows, so that little uh, black box that you see right here is being analyzed. And that is the lipid layer. The thicker it is, the more the light diffracts into the color spectrum. So increased thickness, a nice healthy thick layer has a lot of colors. And this can be quantified. I mean, you can get a qualitative gestalt, but you can quantify it. So right now, the only way to look at the lipid layer assessment for people who don't have this device is you look a little to the left or right of the slit beam and you'll get a little glimpse of color while you're at the slit lamp, but it's it's only about a half millimeter in diameter at 3 or 9 o'clock. It's very hard to really assess what's going on. Now, this is the Keeler Tear Screw. Oop. Oop. We overshot, sorry. This is the Keeler, Keeler Tear Scope. And, um, okay, let's see if I can get this to play. Nope, it's not playing. Okay, this is there. to play automatically. Okay. This has been around for a while. And instead of a half millimeter, it gives you a four millimeter view. And this is a pretty healthy eye. You see a lot of nice colors there. So that's helpful. But not as helpful as the Keratograph 5M, which gives you a much bigger field. It gives you nine millimeters. So when you compare that to the slit lamp and the Keeler tear scope, uh, it's vastly superior. So this is a thick lipid layer. Whoop, okay. Once again, sorry, um, a huge delay here. So thick lipid layer. And you see this looks pretty good. There's purple, blue, green, orange, yellow. So that's assessed for you automatically. I mean, you can, you can figure it out yourself, you know, qualitatively, subjectively, just by looking at this. But um, it's analyzed for you. Now, let's see if we can get the next one. Okay, I'm going for, okay, let me go back. We're missing the thin one. There's a film of a thin layer, and you see the difference. There it is. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's see if we can get to the thin slide here. Okay. So here's the person blinking. There are almost no colors. It's gray. This is a very thin lipid layer. This is someone who's got fairly severe evaporative dry eye caused by meibomian gland disease. Very dramatic difference between the two. Okay, now, the next is perhaps to, uh, the most astonishing of all in my uh, estimation. Uh, the speed and direction with which little specks in the tear film which, which, with which they move is an indicator of tear film viscosity. So we never pay attention, but you see all those little things flying by between blanks, all those little bits of dust, debris, mucus. Uh, the, we really don't pay any attention to them, but they, they can be identified and their speed and direction can be tracked by the Keratograph 5M. Let me show you here. 
So these little tiny single chair foam particles are detect detected and tracked, and uh, it reflects viscosity very accurately and reproducibly. Really, really quite amazing. Now, let me see. OK. So once again, here's somebody blinking. And uh, you know we, we're now able to, to detect and track with treatment tear film viscosity in a very, very reproducible way. Now, my biography of the eyelids. You know, you have to avert the eyelids to, uh, to feed the meibomian glands, obviously, since the tarsus will block the light. So we are all used to doing that. We do a quick uh, flip with a cotton swab. And the very large working distance of the keratograph 5M allows the observation and a version of the upper and lower lid. Uh, the field is 24 millimeters, so we can see the whole tarsal plate of the upper and lower lid. And so this shows you can easily see the meibomian glands of the upper and lower eyelid. The infrared LEDs are used to get this image. And your tech will then take a cursor and manually mark. You can see the red outlines, the area for digital image processing. And you get a really nice 3D representation of the meibomian glands. You can see where they are, where they're dropping out, how torturous they are. And let me show you a few examples here. Uh, so this is somebody who's kind of normal. Uh, there are lots of meibomian glands. They're not very tortuous. Um, I see no areas of dropout here. This looks pretty good. The next. I'm just showing you the raw data. This is early meibomian gland disease. You notice a couple of things. Uh, they're more tortuous, starting to get tortuous. And there's some nasal dropout. Uh, early evidence would suggest that meibomian gl this gland disease, as it progresses, causes dropout of the gland starting nasally and marching temporally. We're not really sure why that is, but that appears to be the case. And Here's the other eye of the same person. And you see the same thing. They're getting tortuous, and there's some dropout over here. So this is the raw data that you get with the, uh, now here's somebody who's much more advanced, much more advanced. You can see they're getting quite tortuous. Uh, there's some dropout, and some of them are shortening. They're no longer as long as they should be. So this is somebody, and you can see even the orifices are distorted. This is somebody with more significant meibomian gland disease. And you can say to the patient, hey, you know, we've halted the loss of your meibomian glands. And you know, if you catch them early enough, some of them will even come back. But of course, if they've had it untreated for many years, sometimes those glands are just gone. But even if most of them or half of them are gone, you can say, look, we stopped. We've still got half of your meibomian glands saved for you. So there are projects underway where people are trying to study this very scientifically who gets the nasal dropout, what treatments are more effective in preventing the pro progression of the dropout. So it's a very, very powerful tool. Now, this is called the R-scan. This is the redness scan it's for automatic detection of bulbar redness. This is going to be FDA approved soon. The hardware and software is already in the Keratograph 5M, and after approval, it will have to be activated. Uh, and someone from Oculus will come by and throw the switch and uh, allow us all to use it. So it's automatic detection of the conjunctival vessels. This is another sort of subjective reading. You can show somebody a red eye, and somebody will say it's 2 plus conjunctival erythema. Somebody else will say trace. Somebody else will say 3 plus. So this is very objective. So you get an image of the eye with the keratograph 5M. Then there's digital image processing by the R-Scan software for automatic detection of the sclera. And then detection of the vessels in the black and white representation. And then it's graded automatically. The ratio between the vessels and the rest of the conj is given to the doctor. So in this particular case, it's a vessel to conj ratio of 15.9%, which is normal. Now, uh, 
it, all, the, all of these I's are graded from grade 0 to grade 4. And it's all based on that ratio of the vessels to conge. Grade 1 to 2 is actually pretty normal. Children and cadavers have grade 0. And um, the far right shows uh, a Broncos fan and who's still weeping. So let's see. Now, this is really cool. Uh, if, you want, if, if you want to quantify ciliary flush, suppose you're taking care of somebody with a red hot eye, you know, a recurrent uveitis or whatever, you can single out just the perilimbal area and, and the ciliary flush will be graded for you. You can say, look, you're getting better on your Durazole or your Predforte or whatever. Uh, very uh, powerful. Now, whoop, mm, okay, go on, let me go back. So we use in our practice the external ocular photography code. And with our mix of payers yeah, on Long Island, Medicare and everybody thrown in, our average reimbursement is running around $40 per patient. So we have been, we, this is external ocular photography and our advisors have told us that we can use this code. And so that is what we do for all of these Keratograph 5M images. So it's a multifunctional topographer. It's really a fantastic tool for anybody with a dry eye clinic. Uh, so you get the topographer that will help the ophthalmologist with pre-op screening, the optometrist with contact lens fitting. And it gives you these fantastic uh, methods for analyzing the tear film. The MIBO scan, the retina scan, the non-invasive tear breakup time, all of these are non-contact, non-invasive, and extremely helpful for classification, documentation, and uh, tracking response to treatment. And it really is a great way to encourage compliance. So now we're going to talk about how wise it is financially to, wise, to establish a dry eye center of excellence. So, and we all know that the halo effect is tremendous, but even in non-surgical dry eye patients. I talked with Bruce Miller. He was very, very helpful in helping me build a, a very conservative financial model. We know there's a revenue opportunity with dry eye patients through their office visits, and they all come in with uh, a number of conditions. Uh, for the most part, you know, they're tremendous associated conditions. 60% of dry eye patients have seasonal allergies, 14% have cataracts, etc. You see. 48% of myopia, you see the list here. And if you make them happy, they refer other patients. Many dry eye patients have been to six, seven, eight doctors. If you're the one who diagnoses and treats them, they'll bring that, you know, that middle-aged lady with dry eyes will bring her parents for cataract surgery and her children for LASIK. So that's been well documented. So Bruce Maller, who is, I think, the uncontested number one uh, consultant to ophthalmology for business purposes, for business advice. He came up with a model, and he was kind enough to share it with me, and I'll sh give it to you here. This is uh, Bruce Miller. What is the value of more of these patients in our practice? So if you have the typical comprehensive practice that's uh, oriented more toward cataracts and or LASIK, if you did some extremely conservative marketing, in other words, you didn't a lot of money. You maybe tucked a uh, brochure about dry eye. You know, we have developed a dry eye center of excellence. Do you have the following complaints? If you stuck a one-page black and white flyer in your invoices for a month or two, that would bring in a lot of dry eye patients. That's been done. Or if you have your text where a button that says, ask me about dry eye, it's very easy to get an extra 1,500 dry eye patients to come in in the following year. So. We know that dry eye patients uh, can come in as a new patient, a comprehensive exam, 92004, that's $140. These are based on uh, 2013 national Medicare rates. One month follow-up exam, 69. By the way, we bring our dry eye patients back, unless they have the mildest dry eye. They all come back four times in that first year. So they come back at one month, then at three months, and then the 12-month recall. So. The total annual, annual revenue per patient is $347. Now, most of my dry eye patients end up with plugs. But in this model, uh, this is just two plugs. And I, I'm usually putting in four for $370. But 
because Bruce wanted to be conservative, he said, let's just put two pump plugs in these people for an additional $211. Okay, wait, okay. Now, there, the Gallup people have done extensive polling. They know exactly how many cataracts will be in those 1,500 dry eye patients, how many of those people will have glaucoma. So out of the 1,500 dry eye patients with a revenue rate per patient of 347, you see the gross revenue would be $520 and $520, $500. The cataracts, assuming that your charming self can only capture half of the cataracts that are in this dry eye population, and I'm sure you could all do much better, once again, Bruce is trying to be conservative. If you're only able to get half of those people to stay with you for cataract surgery, these are clinically significant, ready to come out cataracts. You see the gross revenue here. I'm going over it with my little arrow here, 168,000. We know there will be glaucoma patients there. We know that, you know, once again, if you could only get half of them to, half of them to stay with you, it would be 11.5, and the plug revenue. So. The total value from the dry eye patients so far in this model, so far there's more to come, is over $730,000. You don't have to change the focus of your practice. You can stay dry eye, uh, you can stay cataract and LASIK oriented. This is just additional income from uh, embracing dry eye. Now, what about osmolarity? So all of our dry eye patients get their osmolarity tested every visit. So there are 1,500 patients. They've got two eyes. They're coming in four times. Uh, so you're doing uh, 12,000 osmolarity tests. And this is the average reimbursement per eye. So this is what you bring in. Now, the, the cheer, cheer Lab osmolarity cards cost nothing, but you must, uh, sorry, the Cheer Lab system costs nothing, but you must commit to a certain number of test cards at $10 a piece. So if you back out the cost of the test cards, your net revenue is over $150,000. Now, uh, you know, tier osmolarity is built under the medical plan, so ICD-9 codes do exist for dry eye. We use 375.15 all the time. It's 100% reimbursed by CMS on the laboratory fee schedule, and the national CMS reimbursement is 23.40 per eye. There's no patient copay and no deductible with Medicare, so there are no complaints. And now, a lot of dry eye centers of excellence carry nutritional supplements, most, I would say, of 1,500 new dry eye patients. If your practice could only get 5% of those people to buy your supplements, which is a, a really low rate, at $100 per year, that would be another $7,500. What about adding tear science technology? What about starting to do lipid flow treatments? This comes from that company, and it's an extremely conservative model. Uh, all of these dry eye companies are worried about um, over-promising and under-delivering. So um, since we know the national uh, average is 50% of our patients in our practices have dry eye, so that's what this is based on, and the number with severe dry eye, that's 45% of the 50%. And if you did a very modest number of lip of view uh, treatments, uh, sorry, lip of view photographs, and you only had a 10% conversion rate, if you told patients that they needed lip of flow and only 10% of them decided to, to go on, um, you would do 79 the first year, 142 the second year, and 173 the third year as your confidence grew and your conversion rate went from 10 to 18 to 22 percent. This is very, very conservative, and it's based on an average number of patient visits per week of only 100. Who sees only 100 people per week? Nobody. <laughs> Even Marcus Welby sees more than 100 people a week, but that's how conservative this model is. It's based on seeing 100 people a week. So, you know, uh, if we take that in mind, that this is an extremely conservative model, and we back out the cost of the system, the, and even if we uh, could take into account the average hourly 
uh, income, uh, the average hourly pay for a technician and for a physician, for an ophthalmologist, is that if you back all of that out, your weekly income in the first year from embracing the system would be over 4,500. It'd be on the, it would be over 12,000 the next year, and it would be almost 14,000 the third year. The net profit to the practice, even taking into account uh, what it costs to pay our techs and pay us. So, right before people do a lipoflow treatment, they usually debride the lid margins. You just and our optometrists do this as well. We now have our optometry team doing uh, all the lip flow treatments. You take a little hockey stick and you run it very quickly and gently over the edge of the lid margin because there's often a little fibrovascular membrane there. And, it, and even if you don't do this, the lip flow treatment is effective. But if you do this, it's even more effective. You'll get more of the altered MIBA amount. Turns out there is a code for this. 65205, removal, removal of foreign body external eye, conjunctival superficial. And you have to check with your carrier, of course, and uh, the range is 60 to $80 per debriding. And if you did one debridement per day for 50 weeks, four days out of each week, because one day you're probably in the OR, that's 200 debridements per year. At $70 per debridement, that's $14,000 additional income to your practice. Now, the Keratograph 5M, the purchase price as of today is, is, I think, and Craig can correct me if I'm wrong, $19,975. The lease is $613 a month for a 36-month financing program. At $40 uh, per patient for one or both eyes, one needs 15.3 external photos per month to break even, not counting any income you would gain from using it as a topographer. And of course, you would own the device after the last payment. So if you did only two Keratograph 5M dry eye photographs per year on these 1,500 patients, and you got $40 each time you did it on one or both eyes, which is, once again, you know, there's a different pay mix uh, depending on what kind of insurance your, your patients have. But on Long Island, it works out for us for about $40. That would be another additional $120,000 a year. So the bottom line here is it's really good medicine to treat dry eyes. We have better diagnostic technologies and treatments which lead to happier patients and much better surgical outcomes. It's good business to treat dry eyes from the direct profits and the halo effect and the referrals. There's virtually no medical legal exposure to treating dry eyes. I don't know of anyone except for post-LASIK dry eye a few years ago, which was an issue. But there's virtually no medical legal exposure to treating dry eyes in a virgin eye. And these dry eye patients stay very loyal to our practices for their surgical procedures. So thank you very, very much. And I'm going to turn it back over to Craig, who will be helping me to handle any questions. Dr. Marguerite, thank you very, very much for the uh, presentation. It was great. Uh, we do have a few questions here. Um, Dr. McDonald, if you have a tier lab, a K5, Anterior science. How would you proceed with the treat? How would you proceed with the tests in and in which order? Okay. Um, as people come in, uh, we we give everybody who walks into the practice the speed questionnaire, which actually comes from the tier science people. It takes uh, about sixty seconds or less for the patient to go check, 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 check on a few basic questions. It's a rare person. 40 and over who doesn't check off at least one thing, one uh, symptom. This is the legal justification then to proceed with a tear lab test even before, before the doctor sees the patient. So if there's even one check, believe me, it's rare for there not to be one check. Uh, and by the time you come in, you've got all the usual things, you know, they're uncorrected, best corrected vision. You've got all the things the tech usually does for you, plus you've got a tear osmolarity test. So um, then you say, uh, and, and you've got the sheet, the speed questionnaire that's already documented their symptoms. That you talk to them uh, and you say, you know, I'd really like to um, analyze your tear film in the following way. And you, know, you can't do 
all five of those Keratograph 5M tests and, and send a bill in for five external photographs. So you would pick the one um, that seems most appropriate. If it's very clear cut that they have um, a significant, significant component, component of meibomian gland disease, I would do mybography. Uh, you know, if you think there's um, an aqueous component, you might pick one of the other tests like, uh, well, tear breakup time is great for evaporative as well. But of, you know, the, the mybography and tear breakup are really very, very meibomian gland oriented tests. So you use your judgment. If you see that their meibomian glands look pretty healthy and it's, and it's one of those 10% of the dry eye patients who seems to have aqueous deficient. And that's more common in darkly pigmented people. The lightly pigmented people tend to have more meibomian gland disease, but those 10% of people with pure aqueous tend to be um, African American or darkly pigmented people. If that's the case, then you might want to do the, um, the tear foam particle movement test. Um, and you might also consider the R scan when it's available because the, these people have healthy meibomian glands, but they usually have significant ocular redness. So we expect that to be approved soon. That will be a great addition, and that will be especially important in aqueous deficiency. So you pick the Keratograph 5M study that you think is most appropriate for that particular patient, and you can do it that day. Then you start treatment. Now, if they're like most people, they have mixed mechanism or pure meibomian gland. Then you put them on the regimen. You say, okay, you know, we're going to do soaks and scrubs, and we're going to do erythromycin ointment at night. I love azacite, no longer available. It will be in a few months when another company manufactures it. So at the moment, I use erythromycin ointment at night, and I put them in omega-3s. And depending actually on their tear osmolarity score, they either get, uh, if it's above 317, they'll get restasis. If it's above 325, their artificial tear switches to preservative-free. Below that, I'll, I'll use Fresh Coat, which is my absolute favorite bottle tear. And until about seven weeks ago, it was the only artificial tear in the United States that was by prescription and covered by insurance. And it just went off uh, insurance. But uh, most pharmacies don't seem to know that, so we're still giving people scripts or blink up to versus sustained balance if they won't go with fresh coat for whatever reason. So one of those four tiers they're using, or they're using preservative-free tiers um, every two hours while awake. By the time I switch somebody to preservative-free, it's every two hours while awake. Uh, Omega-3s, my favorite being Tozol, which is by prescription and covered by insurance. Uh, and the formula NASA developed for the astronauts in the space station, and it's got lutein and zeaxanthin. So I put them on the big regimen. And they, they often come back, and they're, if they're uh, improved but not perfect, and their blepharitis is under pretty good control, they'll get their plugs. If they come, and then for the third visit, they often say, you know, I feel better doing all this, but I hate it. I just hate it. Uh, and uh, sometimes I fall asleep, and I don't do it, and I'm trapped, and everybody in the house is asleep, and I'm still scrubbing my lids. Isn't there anything else that I can do? That's when you introduce uh, the lipoflow treatment, and they're usually very receptive at that point. And the math has been done uh, showing that the average uh, moderate to severe blepharitis patient spends just under $3,000 a year on Dr. Copays and Copays for Medicine, but it's death by a thousand cuts. They do just do a little bit each month, so they don't realize how much they've spent. And so this starts to make financial sense because the lipoflow treatment is 1650, and they get at least a year of relief before they and and during that year they're doing 50 to 75 percent less of this regimen. So I usually introduce it at the second or third visit when they say, you know, this works, but I hate it. I just hate it. Now Steve Lane and some of my friends who practice in the middle of the country introduce it on the very first visit. They say, look, your chair osmolarity and your keratograph picture, and look at this. You know, you've got severe dry eyes and blepharitis. And they introduce it right then. I found on Long Island that if they meet me for the first time and I suggest an extremely expensive treatment that's not covered by insurance like lipoflow, they, they don't trust me. So I, I usually save it uh, until they've done the extreme medical regimen for a while. 
And um, you know, these these visits um, are sort of front loaded. Like there's the first visit, the second one is usually only four to eight weeks later, then the third visit is only four to eight weeks later because you're adding and changing things, and then they, they're like, I can't stand it. So I I have a very high conversion. To, to Lipiflow, I can say I had it done and my voice rings with conviction. I've gotten 16 months out of my treatment. I don't have to be retreated yet. So anybody who's, it's just like anything else. If you've had LASIK and you tell your patient you had LASIK, it really impresses them. So um, you know, if you have, and half of you out there, if the statistics are accurate, half of you uh, listening tonight are like me, you have ocular surface disease. So. If you have a lipid flow, it really does help to tell people what your experience was like. And I have a very nice 60-second um, explanation of how lipid flow works. But at any rate, all these technologies work very well together. I would get, I would start off, I would get tear osmolarity and the Keratograph 5M pretty much right away. And then, then uh, once you get comfortable with those tests, you can add uh, lipid flow. And they all work very well together, really well. And you know when it, when somebody's uh, been treated with lipoflow and they come back, and you can show them some of the tests you took with the Keratograph 5M and say, look how much better you are. Oh, and by the way, your tear osmolarity score went down 50 points. And lipoflow is very powerful, but it takes six months for them to get maximum benefit from that one 12-minute treatment. So we bring them back three months after the lipoflow treatment, and they they're halfway to reaching maximum effect, which what they will then hold for at least a year. But you can encourage them. And you can say, you know, this, this treatment is sort of like a glacier, powerful but slow moving. Look how much you've changed in three months. And they'll say, oh, really? That's great. So it reinforces their, the decision they made to have this very expensive treatment. So you know, I, I would recommend embracing all of them, but, but I can honestly tell you, and I would tell you this even if this weren't sponsored by Oculus, but the Keratograph 5M is a very powerful addition. It, and it's easy, easy, easy for patients to understand. And your technician uh, can go over that. You can show them the pictures and then leave your technician if they want to ask you know, any more questions. But it's very, very obvious uh, that they have a diseased eye and that they need to be compliant and, and listen to your advice. Thank you, Dr. McDonald. Uh, another question here. There appears to be dropout in the placido rings nasally. How well does the oculus perform for specialized contact lens fittings such as ortho-K? There appears to be dropout nasally with the... Placido ring. Yeah, placido yeah. ring-based topographers. Oh, well, um, the dropout is caused by the nose shadow. And um, tilting the face slightly to get the nose out of the way usually does the trick. But um, the Keratograph 5M is great for fitting contacts. A lot, of, a lot of practices buy it because it has all this dry eye hardware and software, but it's a tremendous placido base. It's lots of rings, a really, really good placido based topographer. But no matter what topographer you're using, the nasal shadow is caused by the nose. OK, thank you. Um... The question that you were going over about the, the levels in the NIC butt, there's a question here about aren't the NIC butt classifications just level zero for normal, one for suspicious, and two for dry eye? But you did mention in the, in the presentation here about levels four and five. Can you kind of explain a little bit? Yeah, uh, zero, one, two, three, and four, you know, the, usual, the usual clinical classification. Okay, and then because the keratograph only goes to level two. Um, that software is being changed. Okay. Thank you. Um, how is lipid layer analyzed automatically? Well, there are several ways to, to analyze it. The, uh, there is, the lipid layer can be analyzed, of course, by mybography in, indirectly because you're looking right at the glands that produce the lipid layer. Um, the tear film you know, viscosity, uh, for sure. Um, and the the colors, the colors in the spectrum, indicating the thickness of the lipid layer. Thank you. Uh, another question here is, other than keratometry itself, what can you achieve with the oculus that you can't achieve with lippy view? And I'm pretty sure you've covered most of that, where there's the tear film dynamics, meniscus height. Absolutely. Yeah, the, um, the uh, lipid view 
analyzes just the colors of the tear film as a measure of thickness, whereas the, the Keratograph 5M offers that analysis plus all the others. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what is your opinion of intense pulse light on the possible diminishment of meibomian gland dysfunction? IPL from Rolando Toyos um, uh, has been around for a few years. Uh, I had one patient um, a few years ago before we became uh, a dry eye center of excellence and acquired the technologies I've described tonight. I had one desperate patient who flew off, was treated by him, and came back much, much, much better. Uh, the only thing is his system is expensive, um, so is the cheer science technology, but there's more in the peer-reviewed literature about cheer science, and I've called Rolando, who I think is uh, very smart, a brilliant guy, actually, and I said, Rolando, let me help you write these papers, and uh, I, uh, I offer my services for free, because he has a lot of data, but he's a busy clinician, and he hasn't uh, put much in the peer-reviewed literature, so if you're sitting down to, to decide whether you're going to get IPL or cheer science, you, you have a tendency to go with the one that, that has provided the most data and has gone through the scrutiny of peer review. But um, it makes sense, and uh, I know people with the IPL system who are very, very happy with it. I just, I just wish he would publish more about it. Uh, I do know one drawback. You have to be careful of darkly pigmented people whereas uh, the Cheer Science Unit will work on anybody with any skin type, any, any, uh, any race, it doesn't matter. But um, you know, I, I think there's something to IPL. I just wish that Rolando would get more uh, out there in, into the scientific journal. Thank you. Uh, question here, is the Nick butt repeatable? Do you take more than one measurement, and do you hold the eyelids to prevent blinking? And do you do it before installing fluorescein? Yes, to all of those above, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, there is a question here about um, sort of EMRs. It says, are the testing measurements easily imported into EHR such as NextGen? Did you want to answer that one, or would, would you like me to answer that one? Go right ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, with the with the keratographs and all of Oculus' equipment, there is the option to export any one of the uh, images you see on the screen into JPEG format to any file on the computer system or on a server, and then have your EMRs pull that data, those JPEG images from that file. Um, Oculus also has basic DICOM compatibility where we're able to export in DICOM format any one of those uh, images you see on the screen for the software as well and you can also save some of those as PDF documents. Uh, if you were to purchase the full modality of DICOM then the Oculus devices can push the information directly into the DICOM system. Uh, another question here is um, what procedure codes did you use for debridement of lids, and what diagnosis codes were you using for external photography? Well, you know what? We have to go back in the presentation because I haven't memorized the numbers, but I, I showed them on the slide. Can we, let's see. Uh, yes. Um, how far back do we need to go? Here we go. I'm going back. Okay. Wait. Uh, oh. There. Oops. Uh, 65205 was epithelial debridement of the lid margins. Wait. Did I accidentally? Diet? No. No, I think you did cover it. No, but that, what was this, the other code? There was another. Oh, that was the code for external photography is nine two two eight five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you did mention that as well. Alrighty, um, I think we're just about running out of time here, so uh, Dr. Marguerite McDonald, thank you very much 
On behalf of Oculus and the attendees, we thank you for your time and educational webinar you have shared with us tonight. We look forward to working with you again in the near future. Thanks, Craig. This was fun. And thank you for sticking with me tonight. Have a good you're, night, all. You're very welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending another great educational webinar by Oculus and by Dr. Marguerite McDonald. Please keep watching your emails and Oculus website for educational webinars on different instruments and topics. This webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the Oculus website very soon. The Oculus website is www.oculususa.com. There is also a uh, section on the website for future webinars that have already been posted. You can click on those and pre-register for them. There is also a link that you can enter in your email for any webinars that are not posted as of yet, but you would like to receive um, any type of information on those. Again, please uh, check out our website and click on majority of those and enter in your information if you'd like to. Thank you very much and have a good evening.